Future CD Show of an 18 CD set containing sessions from a four week course by Ram Das titled The Yogas of the Bhagavad Gita. This CD contains part one of session number 11 titled Devotion and the Guru. Tonight we're going to deal specifically with the concept of the guru and um, the whole love and light phenomenon. It is particularly fitting that we do so today because today happens to be a very sacred day in the Hindu tradition. It is uh, Guru Purnima Day, which is the day in which one can do anything one wants to one's guru. <laughs> so in uh, honor of that tonight, I would like to lecture first on bhakti, devotional techniques, love, the method of the guru, how it works, what you do, what the guru does, what doesn't do, and perhaps if we can, the role of the witness as an aspect of the guru. Then, well, what I would like to do is to share with you a darshan, which means a spiritual visit with my guru, since those of you that get any kind of a heart connection out of these lectures, although you won't believe it when I say it, some of you. I'd like you to meet the uh, man behind the scenes, because <laughs> uh, it's really his trip. I am totally a uh, wind-up robot, and you say, oh, now that's a hang-up in your mind, and we'll deal with that. Watch your emotional reactions to all this stuff as you go along. It's far up. So what we will do is, after I finish the lecture, we will do arti, which is the light ceremony to the guru, which we do every day at our homes, our respective puja tables at homes. And I'll, I'll translate it for you, and then we'll do it for you. And at that time, we will be offering, as we talked about sacrifice or offering, we will be offering food, which then becomes prasad or consecrated food through the process of offering it. And the food that we are offering is <clears throat> a huge vat of... Um, Halva, which um, it's, it's Indian halva, it's very nice, and uh, it was made with much love, and it has a huge Hindi Ram written on it in raisins, and uh, it was made for you, for the guru, it'll be offered to the guru, and then it'll be taken to the door, and as you leave, you will be given some prasad from this uh, experience, okay? Um, when you receive it, it might just help, if, since you might as well learn the Hindu traditions and play it, you know, you ought to be flexible enough to be a Buddhist on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and a Hindu on Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. Okay. So when you are being a Hindu and you take food, uh, the way to receive prasad is you hold your hands like this with your right hand on top, and a little of the food is put in your hand. You don't reach for it, you don't take it, it's given to you. Right? And you don't take it with your left hand. Okay. In India, it's very clear. You use the left hand to go to the toilet and the right hand to eat. And it's all very simple. We get a little confused here. Um, after uh, the arti, the light ceremony, then um, we will continue with the slide presentation. And during the time I'm show we're showing you slides, Ramesh Vadas has prepared of Maharaji, um, I'm just going to give you little stories about him and little one-liners of what he said and just convey to you a little bit so that you can visit with him. It's just visiting another being. You might not have a chance to go to India, and if you did, he's left his body, so it would be difficult. So uh, we're bringing him here through technology. <laughs> the technology of the heart. Uh, the reason we have to <clears throat> go to these lengths, if you will, is because the quality of bhakti or devotion is really not something that we can sit down and intellectually figure out. It is something that has to do with the heart. And there's a little absurdity about talking about heart trips. There's something that one feels or one experiences in a, a realm that is not necessarily conceptual. So that I haven't... Um, made this uh, series of lectures very, very much talking about devotion and love because I thought rather than talk about it, we just let it sneak in on us through the kirtan, through the singing, through the 
the mala, the mantra of opening the heart, through just being together in love and let it all happen to us individually. Because that is the spirit of the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is concerned with service and with wisdom, the higher wisdom, but it is all ultimately in the Gita in a context of devotion. And chapter 12 is in a way the, the love focus quality of the Gita. But if you reflect on the way Arjuna is taken through the sequence by Krishna, you realize that at some point Krishna says to Arjuna, it is because of your love that I'm allowing you to hear all this and see all this. And the vision that is bestowed upon Arjuna, which is an incredible grace to have that vision, the vision of the cosmic forms, the vision to open the third eye to see without looking, and the awesome and, in a way, horrible or awful nature of the vision, that was only bestowed on Arjuna because of his love, really, and his devotion and the purity of his uh, relationship to Krishna. And if you trace the sequence in the Gita, you see that there is a certain, what we call lower knowledge, lower gyan, which led to a certain kind of faith, because faith is sort of the lower mind having the faith in the possibility that it all is something else, which is what the higher mind knows, but the lower mind doesn't. And that faith leads you to purification, which we talked about last time. And that purification, as you quiet down, you start to open a bit, and that allows you to have some visions or some direct immediate experiences, which leads you to a deeper kind of awe and devotion to it all, and finally to the higher wisdom, which is the wisdom of the Brahman, and the wisdom of the Purushatma in relation to the Brahman. And oftentimes, I think that you may feel, especially as you are at Naropa, that there is a tremendous struggle going on between the head trippers and the heart trippers, between the gyanis and the bhaktis, between the people that say, be cynical, be tough, be cold, don't buy all that emotional crap, and the people that are saying, love, drown in the ocean of my love, it's okay. And it all looks sloppy and mushy and yik and... The intellect looks so clean and tight, you know. But you've got to see that it's very much like a mountain and that the different paths start from different parts of this very wide base of the mountain. And you start from where you're at. And then as you get up the mountain, these all things start to come together. And really near the top, it all becomes very, very, very intermingled. So that if in a advanced class or a weak moment, that couldn't be a weak moment. In an advanced class, you would get Trungpa, for example, to start to reminisce about his relations to his gurus or talk about the devotional quality of Buddhism. You would begin to sense a lot of these qualities which he uses. He uses words that are much different. He uses, I mean, the most emotional word he gets are things like warmth. <laughs> See? Because he's being a very cool. But when I'm with him, I feel this incredible, uh, loving, devotional being. Although I don't think that's his particular ray. And I think what you're being subjected to here at Naropa, in many different ways, through many of the different teachers here, is a recognition that the game isn't one of good and evil. You might sit around saying, look, he's a bad guy and he's a good guy, or she's wonderful and she's no good because they think that way. But as you get more sophisticated, you begin to recognize that as you go down the mountain, there are beings along the way down the mountain that are there to guide you, or that are vehicles of guidance, whether they think they are or not. They're placed in different parts of the mountain, and they represent what are called in theosophy various rays of God. And part of our work is to honor the various rays, honor the various rays through and realize that Trungpa represents a ray that is different than the ray I represent. It doesn't mean that the ultimate truth I can't share. Now the question is, how much your vehicle of getting to the top of the mountain should look exactly like how it would be at the top of the mountain? Or how much you can afford dualism to get to non-dualism? That's really the crux of the issue of devotion. Because devotion is a dualistic thing. It is devoted to something. 
And if you're going to have to give up subject-object distinctions, wouldn't it be better not to get stuck in them in the beginning? That's really the general way that the thought sequence goes. Well, the predicament is this, that in order to absorb the wisdom the, through this direct experience, you have to be very, very intensely one-pointed in where you're going. And part of the lubrication that greases the process, an intense love for it, whether you call it a love for truth, or a love for God, or a love for guru, it doesn't matter. But the emotional commitment is very intense. Recently I was with some very advanced students of Trungpa's up in Washington State. They are sort of people who head these kinds of things we're into now. Not these particular ones. But. And we were driving back in a car from somewhere, and I was sitting there, and I, they always kid me a lot about me being this kind of slushy, devotional bhakti. It's a very loving kind of kidding, I think. <laughs> and uh, at least it is the way I'm receiving it. If it's not the way they're sending it, that would be their problem, of course. Um, and they were talking about Trungpa, and they were telling Trungpa stories, which is a great uh, pastime among Trungpa devotees. <laughs> and as I was sitting there in the car listening, I suddenly couldn't distinguish between this and sitting in India telling the stories about Maharaji. It had that same total love and adulation, and you know what he did then? And, and then he danced around the stupa, and, like, and they were describing how he danced and what it looked like. And I turned around and I said, you know, you're nothing but a group of sloppy bhaktis. I can't stand you, you know. And, and they said to me, well, don't tell anybody. So I, of course, am doing that specifically right now. <laughs> Because love makes the thing happen so easily. That opening of the heart makes it happen so easily. In, in the Psalms, David says in the Old Testament, Because my heart was enkindled, my reins also were changed. And in that horse image, that uh, chariot image in the Gita, where the reins are the mind, and applying that, when my heart was opened, that made it easier for my mind to change. And that's really what the whole issue of devotion is, is a way of making it very easy to turn your heart in a certain, to turn your mind in a certain direction. And uh, at different times in the Gita, Krishna says one thing is higher than another, but in general, the devotional quality of whatever you're doing adds to what you're doing. And the whole business about dualism and non-dualism is, if you use a method that is dualistic, and use it with as much wisdom as you have, I can know perfectly well, as you will see in my talking about my guru, that that's not what it's about, but that's an absolutely first-rate vehicle through. And even though he knows and I know, and he knows I know and I know he knows I know he knows I know, still it's okay. The method works, and then as the method works, you go beyond method and the whole thing falls away. But it has to fall away. The minute you push your heart away because you think it's too shoddy as a vehicle, it's going to cling. You're going to have a turned off heart and it won't work. The game won't work so well. Because head tripping will only take you so far and then you become like sort of parched dry leaves. And Krishna says in the Gita, it's very, very difficult to go the route of merely identifying with the unmanifest, which is the way of Zen, it's the shunyata, the way of just letting go of everything, nowhere to stand. It's a very difficult way. It's a very, it's known as the, the, the path that has no railing, the high path that has no railing. It's like going straight up the mountain with no hand railing. And if you can do it, do it. If you can be it, be it. But the devotional quality which sneaks into all these methods just uh, makes it all go so much easier. Hafiz, the poet, said, O thou who are trying to learn the marvel of love from the copy book of reason, I'm very much afraid that you'll never really see the point. Okay. That if, to the extent that you try to think your way through this devotional issue, it's not going to make it. When I see people individually now and then, I notice how many people are just so heavy into their heads and they're just so afraid to love, just so afraid to let the liquid flow of the universe happen to them. They may be very much into their bodies and very much into their heads, but their heart isn't open. I, again and again I say to somebody, you know, 
It's just not a strong heart connection yet. Because to get through the door, you can't close off anything. It's all going to be wide open. The fear of opening the heart is the fear of new attachment. And the problem is that every method, as you know, those of you that have meditated for a long time, how trapping it is, how hooked you get on meditation. All methods are traps. And in my relation to my guru, at first, look at his form and just be around him. And then as time went on, not that the love grew less, the love grew different, grew different, until I was very fulfilled just being at a distance in relation to him. And then as time went on, it kept growing deeper and deeper until finally I didn't really care whether I was with his form anymore. And then as I went deeper still, I started to relate to him in a way where it wasn't that man in India anymore. It was the essence of guru-ness. And then I began to experience it in myself in relation to him. And the whole quality of the dynamics of the relationship were changing as I was growing in wisdom and as my heart was opening and my surrender was greater. The way I've kidded about it is I worshipped his form until I suddenly realized that that was just the doorpost and I was just rubbing the doorpost. I've told you this. You know, I was just worshipping doorposts and saying my doorpost is better than yours doorpost. And I saw that was merely the door jam and you looked through and you kept looking through and each surrender led you in and in and in. And it was a method that took you right back to yourself and to be on form. And a lot of the qualities of renunciation or intellectual discriminations that are really difficult when you're trying to do them in a rajasic, I can do it type way, in the presence of love, they're incredibly easy. Like those of you that have had a really powerful love affair, love relationship, will recognize what it's like to care more about your beloved than about yourself. And you can go like you, your favorite food comes on the table. Can you imagine getting to the point where your main concern is that the other person have enough of it and that you're fulfilled that they should eat it? When you have a child, that's the kind of experience you get. And somebody says, aren't you self-effacing? Aren't you sacrificing to your child? But it isn't sacrifice, it's joy. And all austerities with a dry heart are really heavy. With love, they become like, oh, yeah, wow, well, I'll do this for my lover. I'll do this for my beloved. I'll give this up. That'll get me closer. I mean, when you really want to get close to your beloved, boy, you can't give things up fast enough. You know, that's getting in the way. Oh, I don't want to read that. I can't do that because it'll keep me from my beloved. And we'll talk a moment about the intensity of that kind of love as it develops. One of the factors in enlightenment in Southern Buddhism is rapture. And rapture has that quality of the flow of feeling, flow of feeling. And it's a thing, it's a factor for enlightenment. It's a helpful factor for enlightenment. And so the method we're talking about is bhakti yoga, the yoga of devotion, the yoga of the heart, the yoga of love of loving openness to God, to guru, to self, to God and other beings. The quality of love, as described by Mayor Baba, this is one of the most beautiful quotes that uh, I've read. It says, love has to spring spontaneously from within. It's in no way amenable to any form of inner or outer force. Love and coercion can never go together. But though love cannot be forced on anyone, it can be awakened in him through love itself. Love is essentially self-communicative. Those who do not have it catch it from those who have it. True love is unconquerable and irresistible and it goes on gathering power and spreading itself until eventually it transforms everyone whom it touches this was the message of Christ a being becomes love and everything they touch is loved is in the aura of love and it's so interesting the thing about it not being amenable to force out of the best intentions, it still doesn't work. I can sit with somebody and I can see that their heart is closed 
and I want to say to them, open your heart. Okay? You ought to love more. And I say, what are you feeling? The person says, nothing. Okay? And then I try. I say, tell me about this and that. And then, what are you feeling? Nothing. Because I'm trying. Stop trying so hard. And I just hang out and I just love them enough. Just be here in love. After a while, they, you know, the person says, I don't feel anything. And then they get up and they say, can I hug you? Why do you want to hug me if you don't feel anything? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Thomas Merton said, if you have love, you will do all things well. Corinthians. Love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not its own, is not provoked, taketh not account of evil, rejoiceth not in unrighteousness but rejoiceth with the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hope all things, endure all things. Love never faileth. Every now and then in these lectures, I've dropped the line, but I've let it pass because it's a little far out for, without this course going on for quite a bit longer, I have the line, suffering is grace. And it's very hard for people to hear that. Suffering is grace. That when you've got all your troubles, all your sorrows, all your difficulties, all your weighty sufferings, which everybody has, that that is grace that's been given to you. And that's far out because it sounds so Pollyanna-ish or so masochistic or something. And it's only in this space of love that that starts to make sense. Otherwise, it won't make sense to you ever. Reason will never allow you to understand the concept of suffering is grace. But the love that Paul's talking about is not romantic love. It isn't the level of I love so-and-so for their personality. It isn't that kind of love. It's what's called conscious love or Christ love. It's not possessive love. It's a place where you meet another being in your heart of hearts. It's not a needful, neurotic kind of thing. It has a quality of freedom connected with it which most people don't associate love with. They associate love with an intense, possessive quality. C.S. Lewis in Paralandra has conveyed that quality a little bit. He says, love me, my brothers, for I am infinitely superfluous, and your love shall be like his, meaning God, born neither of your need nor of my deserving, but just bounty, plain bounty. The love, like the Aditya mantra, is shines on everything independent of whether it is lovable or not. You don't have to sit and judge whether you can afford to love the thing. It's just much easier to love everything. Just put the, it on everybody. And people who say to me, but I don't feel any love. I don't feel any of the stuff you're talking about. I keep remembering this Thomas Merton quote from Seeds of Contemplation. Prayer and love are learned in the hour when prayer becomes impossible and the heart has turned to stone. It's only when your despair gets greatest that that possibility occurs for that heart opening. So when somebody comes in and says, I feel nothing, I feel dead, it's horrible, to me that's the critical moment. That's the moment when... The, the possibility of the heart opening, if the despair is just great enough. Sometimes you see it isn't great enough yet. They're still trying to think their way out. And I'd usually say, go away and suffer some more and come back in about a year. You know, you haven't suffered enough. Go suffer some more. People don't think that's compassionate. In our tradition of Ram, the statement is, Ram likes love only. A man who is able to know this can know. And out of traditions that we are familiar with, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. 
If you take a line like that, which you've all heard thousands of times, you start to consider, could it possibly mean anything? You know, you know. Is, is it just a hype done by hypey people trying to control people, possibly be talking about something that I could open to? The history of devotional yoga is loaded with examples of intensity of love, where the love gets so powerful. Mayor Baba spent a lot of time going around washing musts. Musts are what are called God intoxicants. In this country, they would be put in mental hospitals and be considered psychotic. But there are some very clear distinctions. It's not that they are so much in the world that they're all screwed up about it because of their anxiety. It's because their fifth chakra is open and they've turned inward towards God and they couldn't care less about their body, about the social scene. It's just all fallen away. They can't keep it together. They don't remember their zip code. <laughs> and Meher Baba used to go around and wash these must give them baths and keep them in ashrams and build places for them these people that nobody else wanted to go near because they were just so crazy and flipped out and we talked uh, one night when uh, the fellow was here we talked about people who are going through ch stages where e it's easy for you when they inconvenience you to say well that person's neurotic and i wish the hell they'd get out of the way but there is another recognition which comes with your own quieting where you honor the fact that somebody is going through some very profound spiritual awakenings and that at that point they must be treated with a lot of love and compassion. And what we need is more ashrams of what is Trungpa starting with Maitreya, that kind of quality of place which is a uh, total care scene for people who are going through these transformations but with spiritual consciousness behind them. Ramakrishna said, Cry unto the Lord with a longing and yearning heart, and then you shall see him. People would shed a jug full of tears for the sake of their wife and children. They would drown themselves in a flood of tears for the sake of money. But who cries for the Lord? I mean, think about what you've cried for in your lifetime. When somebody put you down? When you lost something? When you made a fool of yourself? And these musts, when the, this thing happens, this intense love, it's also referred to in the Bible, in Isaiah, when he's talking about these beings, and he says, they are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. There was a very, very beautiful devotee of God, who sang, who created incredible songs. Her name was Mirabai. And this is an example of a song which, if you look at it from a hard-headed place, is absolutely grotesque. But if you can empathize with what it is like to love something so much, so much, that nothing else matters, then you can experience what Mirabai is singing about when she says, Oh, black vultures, Eat away everything of this flesh, but discriminately. Leave these two eyes, for they still hope to see the Lord. O black vultures, pull out these eyes as well and take them to his presence. Only make an offering of them to the Lord before you devour them. Right. This intense kind of... The body means nothing. Recently, um, we put out these records called Love, Serve, Remember. And in the album, um, I did a reading of the fifth uh, descent, the fifth chapter from Tulsi Das's Ramayana. And Tulsi Das, this is the kind of folk version of the Ramayana. And it is totally liquid bhakti love. And when you hear those records, you will hear the, what that quality is. Because I wanted, I also read the third Chinese patriarch on those records, which gives you the other mm, quality, the don't, uh, 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 you know, the total knife that's so sharp that you never even feel it cut. And this one is just, oh, it's just like drowning in it, drowning in, in lush devotion. 
And this chapter that I read starts out with this opening, which will give you a feeling of just how completely drunken Tulsi Das is. As a, he's just starting a chapter, right? It's no big deal. He's just starting a chapter. And he's talking about Ram. He says, I adore the Lord of the universe, bearing the name of Rama, the chief of Raghu's line, the mine of compassion, the dispeller of all sins, appearing in human form through his maya, deluding potency, the greatest of all gods, knowable through Vedanta, constantly worshipped by Brahma, the creator, Shiva, Sesha, the bestower of supreme peace in the form of final beatitude, placid, eternal, beyond the ordinary means of cognition, sinless and all-pervading. There is no other craving in my heart, O Lord of the Raghus. I speak the truth, and you are the spirit indwelling the hearts of all. Grant me intense devotion to your feet. O crest jewel, and free